okay. Show's about to start, and big surprise, Rish hasn't shown up yet. Sometimes I wonder why I even let him be a part of this podcast, since he really doesn't contribute in any meaningful... Oh, hey, the answering machine light's blinking. Maybe it'll be Rish asking if I want to change my long-distance service. Hey, Big. Rish here. I um, I won't be making it to the podcast today. I uh, Big shock. Well, you lame killed. excuse. Well, you see, I finally decided to kill myself. I've given this plenty of thought, and... Well, I, I think we'd both agree that it's the best thing for everyone. Oh, no. The podcast helps for a little while, but nobody really likes it. And I know you'd rather be making babies on Monday night, so... Damn it. Let me call his number. Maybe I'm not too late. So, thanks for everything. Good luck with that alien love story novel you'll never finish. Bye. Oh, crap, I got his voicemail. Rish! It's big. If you're hearing this, don't kill yourself. We got a donation today. Some guy named Matt Scherzinger, and he actually likes the podcast. He even signed up to donate again. Don't do it, dude. Let's talk about it. Your little contributions are important to the show, and... Dang, this is hard to say. You're important to me, man. Without you, there'd be nobody to remind me how studly I was in high school and how handsome I was in college and how every girl wanted to jump my bones and how some still do. Like when we were walking through the mall and some babe young enough to be my daughter's checking me out and you get so jealous and you go like making little fists with your hands like a three-year-old throwing a tantrum. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I should have told you this a long time ago, but... Hey, Big. Rish? Sorry I'm late. I thought you were going to kill yourself. What happened? I didn't tie the noose right. It just slipped out and I fell on the floor. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why? Did you want to talk me out of it or something? Not really. Just sit down and start recording. You can't even kill yourself right. Gosh, you're such a loser. Welcome back to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Well met, adventurers. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 12. 12. 12. It's a good number. Tonight's episode is, Hi, I'm Rish Outfield. That sounds like a good story. I want to read it. No, you don't. And you? And I'm Big Anklevich. And there's the robot. 08 OT. Cheers, guys. And the announcer man. He is on today, right? Not announcer man, but... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't remember to switch him on before we started. Darn, why did I say anything? Ugh. <laughs> Today's episode is Playable Character by Eric Juno. Eric Juno is a software engineer from Minnesota. He writes fantasy and science fiction in his spare time. He maintains a blog somewhat regularly at authorquest.blogspot.com. There's a dash between the author and the quest, but that's okay. We'll put the link in the show notes. And this is his first sale. Huzzah! <laughs> Today's story was produced and edited by Brian Lincoln, and we'd also like to thank Liz Lincoln, John Lincoln, and Brian Lincoln for lending their voices to this episode, as well as Bukas and Gomez from the AIE Guild on Earth and Ring, and Aria and Sayek from the Imperfection Guild on Lightning Hoof for also lending their voices to today's episode. Playable Character by Eric J. Juno Logging into Server Parsing Protocol Loading Logged in 
Cyril was standing in the marketplace, looking between a frost dagger and harbinger leggings of strength when his player logged in. The sharp jolt made him grit his teeth. Then he smiled pastily. Hello, player, Cyril said. Welcome back to Izzy Sanyatrib. The world time is 3.11, and you have no new messages. Every single time he had to say that. It was like being a non-playable character again, back when all he did was point out how many years it had been since the Thuggian fields were plagued by razor-clawed rats. Where are we going today? Cyril asked. There was no immediate response. Either there was some lag, or his player was taking his sweet time. Hey, hello. I'm standing here looking pretty. What are we going to do today? I hope you didn't log on just to admire my armor. Hint, hint. Cyril's armor consisted mostly of things he wore when he was still level 11. The best thing he had was a golden chest plate he'd received as a rare drop from a Murfeter ox. Clerics didn't get a very high armor class, and it was the only thing that kept him out of newbie missions. Hey, how about we check some clan boards? Maybe join one? No response. Or we could harvest some thistle greens? No response. Hey, it's your credit card, or your parents. Waste your time, see if I care. Then Cyril received his response. What? Oh, not the serpent dragon. Come on, I don't feel like fighting today. Yes, I know we have all the requirements, but that doesn't mean... His player headed him toward the flagpole to look for a party of adventurers. You sure? You don't want to look for some new armor first? No? All right. He heard the ambient noise of a crowd before he saw it. Sound loaded faster than objects. Then the rest of the world formed around him. A medieval pig man walked by, snorting through the gold ring in his nose and holding a sticking spear. A pale-skinned unicronian with six arms shook a carpet out his window. Elves, centaurs, gargoyles, and dwarves passed him on their way to the fields. The streets never used to be this crowded, but a lot of Avatar's players had become bored and never logged back in. Without a player, Avatars were limited to safe zones. It was an old world, and Cyril was glad his player was still active, even though he obviously hadn't read a single FAQ. Burdoko license. Get a Burdoko license. A shopkeeper shouted. Cyril looked over. Burdoko license? We could train a Burdoko. That way I wouldn't have to walk everywhere. It would take less time to get places. He was ignored. In the center of the marketplace, a large crowd had gathered, all focused on a central point. Hey, what's this? Cyril said. Let's check it out. Thankfully, his player obeyed his request, and steered him toward the thick mass. There were too many tall races in the back to see what was going on. He could hear swords swinging and muffled explosions of magic spells. Why is there a battle going on in the middle of town? Cyril asked. He jumped up and down, trying to find a space between two mammothites. Cyril, what ho? Cyril looked toward the voice. A giant man with an axe on his back and wild cinnamon hair waved at him. Oh, jeez, Bulbadeer. Cyril covered his face with his hand and looked away. Don't connect with him, please, Cyril asked. But it was too late. Bulbadeer raised his axe and pointed. Cyril, a battle! Doth it not excite the blood? He pointed over the heads of others. Come hither! Methinks here be the best view for thee. Cyril sighed and trudged over to Bulbadeer. He still had that obnoxious authentic speak mod installed, but at least there was a vacant spot by him. The barbarian clapped a beefy hand on his shoulder. If it wasn't for his armor, Cyril would have lost five HP. How doth the morrow find you, yon Cyril? he asked. I'm fine, dude. You don't need to talk like that. In what manner of speech dost my friend protesteth? Cyril slumped his shoulders. 
Never mind. Two knights stood facing each other in a circle, casting magic spells and skill chain attacks. A white ring encircled them, marking off the boundaries of the arena. It's a player versus player fight? Cyril said. In the middle of Jastok Square? What's going on? Well, the gladiator in the guise of silver yonder hath pooched the other of a regai mirror, that which hath come from hours of grinding in the Stygian depths of the Garuda Plains. Yonder truth seeker with a blade of vermilion decries this. The game judge wrought his decision that the avatars shall hold contest to render verdict. A game judge stood stiff in the corner, watching the two. His hands rested on a long, cleaver-like sword plunged in the dirt. He was dressed in thick, cast-iron armor, covering every bit of skin. A knee-high mirror with gold trim sat at his feet. So you're saying one of those guys tried to scam an item from the other, and the game judge is having them duke it out? Forsooth, Bulbadir said. You get all that? Cyril asked his player, who confirmed that he did. The Black Knight held out his hand, and a white protective dome appeared over his head. (laughs) The Silver Knight took the opportunity to strike a blow, (laughs) but it wasn't very effective. Why is the judge having them fight about it instead of just making a judgment? Bulbadir shrugged his heaving shoulders. Tis knowledge unbeknownst to me. Perhaps he was vexed earlier and wishes to project his wrath. Who knoweth if any judges have players any longer? They may be no more than lost souls wandering the landscapes, hoisting their own brand of justice upon the unfortunate. The Black Knight lifted his sword overhead and brought it down. It passed through the other knight's body, and the number 2456 appeared over his head. A basic but strong attack. The defender stretched his purple blade into the air, and a white wind full of sparkling fairies swirled around him. The number 1435 appeared in green, then faded away. Bulbadir nudged Cyril. Yonder Black Knight hath been proving his mettle for some time now. All the grey-clad warrior may do is heal a score as much as a strike. Uh, What? No sooner had he said that than the Black Knight brought down his sword like he was chopping wood. The Silver Knight dropped to his knees and collapsed in the dirt as soon as the white numbers of doom blinked over his forehead. Some avatars clapped their hands in courtesy. The Black Knight turned to the game judge and said, All right, I won. Okay, give me the mirror. The game judge remained motionless. Ah, you have. Judgment is rendered fair to you. His tone sounded stilted and emotionless under the metal. The game judge picked up the mirror, tucked it under the crook of his arm, and walked away to the edge of the crowd. The Black Knight called back. Um, hey, don't I get my mirror back? The judge turned around. The battle was to decide justice, not reward. There is no reward for liars, and stupidity is its own punishment. Do I make myself clear? What? You you can't do that! I earned that mirror! The game judge pointed his saber at him, raising it as slowly and menacingly as possible. All judgments rendered by the game judge are final, he said, quoting the sacred terms of use. Or would you receive a different judgment? The Black Knight stood motionless for a moment, clenching his fists, trying to find words. The audience held their breath. No one had ever seen an Avatar take on a game judge. In fact, the terms of use considered that to be illegal. Those who spread rumors about such an event were dismissed as having been on the losing end of one of their decisions. Would the rules be broken this time? The Knight huffed and walked back into the crowd. This instance would not be different. The game judge walked back into the market, and the crowd dispersed. "'Twas a fine match. Nothing like a bit of spectacle before a day's work," he breathed in and out. "'Ah! So, Cyril, what news? For what reason dost you partake of the market?' Cyril didn't respond for a second. "'Hang on. My player's trying to make me wave.' 
But he keeps opening the system menu. Cyril waved his arm back and forth outlandishly. Ah, there we go. I'm going to the flag to raise a group for the serpent dragon today. The white wyvern of Rofetunia? Ooh, tis many a fellow who's gone to the graveyard thanks to that beastie. Ye'd be best to stay clear, for his aggression meter speaketh of gross exuberance. I just need a topaz gem. I'm probably the only person in the world who's trying to get it without buying it. Ye have enough the lacy and elf grass, I'd wager. Yep. And ye've paid your tribute to the Phoenix Woman, shown her your title and deed? Yeah, I did that. Thou art well met. For this journey I shall accompany you, for no doubt a strong hand with an axe in your corner shall pull the victory for you and earn you your just reward. He pulled his rune axe out of the scabbard on his back and held it to the sun so the razor-thin blade sparkled. Fantastic. Cyril monotoned. Well, you can be a damage dealer. Sounds! Tis the role I was born for. Not but a healer dost we require now, and we mayest be on our way, though finding one may take us time. Cyril smiled and looked over Bulbadeer's spiked shoulder. Don't worry. I think I see one on the way now. He waved at the oncomer. Bulbadeer looked puzzled for a split second longer than a smarter avatar would, then turned around. By the surly beard of Mrithk! Her head was covered in a shiny chitin carapace, hiding her hair, if she had any. She barely looked human with her bulging red eyes, purple skin, and body armor that was more organic than metallic. Thin, woolly hair grew on her shins. When she opened her mouth, two top teeth clicked back and forth like mandibles. She looked like an aborted fetus that had grown up and merged with a black widow spider. Hey, Cyril! She waved. Bulbadeer's hand went to his axe as he darted in front of Cyril. A venomous monster in a safe town! What vile abomination did ye crawl from? Get thee behind me, demon! Dude! Cyril elbowed Bulbadeer in the ribs. It's cool, I know her. She's one of us. The monster said, Hey, I didn't choose to be an arachnivore. My player's kid brother matched the keys when she was picking an avatar, so I got confirmed as her choice. She wanted one of those unicorn people, so thanks for your consideration. Sorry about that, Cyril said. Yes, I mourn deeply for your condition, Bulbadeer said. Cyril elbowed him again. I mean, my reaction. Your reaction? My player's a 12-year-old blonde girl from upstate New York. She named me Peach Butt. How do you think I reacted to that? <laughs> Bulbadeer snickered. Cyril resisted the temptation to smack him over the head, which might have provoked a PvP. It's cool, okay? She's a good healer. I've been in a few dungeon crawls with her before. <clears throat> Bulbadeer cleared his throat and returned to a serious countenance. Any allies of yours are allies of mine. I heard you were going to take on the Serpent Dragon. We're trying to get the quest completion reward. My player gets a trophy in our safe house so she gets ten quests in a day. She sighed. <sighs> she tells me to tell you it's sparkly and glittery. She rolled her eyes. Also, she desperately wants to do your hair. She pointed at Bulbadeer. He looked startled and touched his beard. What? My curly locks? Cyril rolled his eyes and asked Peach Butt, Do you have any white magic? She laughed. <laughs> I pick up nothing but white spells. I've got enough items to heal an army. All right, that's good. Well, let's get going. Cyril took off toward the Serpent Dragon's cavern. Wait, Peach Butt said. We're walking? Don't you have a vertical license or an airship ticket? Talk to my cheap player, Cyril said. The journey to the Ignatius Cavern took ten real-time minutes on foot. They expected to see an empty cave on a hill leading into the Serpent Dragon's lair, but when they arrived they saw a group of rigid avatars standing in formation. 
They were all dressed in a stylized version of samurai armor. Plated vermilion tunics drawn down around the leggings. Shogun helmets trimmed with bronze completed the garb. Blood knights? What are they doing here? Forsooth! Doth my eyes deceive me? Be all ten of them staking a claim? But they're all the same class. You'd need a party with a lot more variety than that to defeat the serpent dragon. Are they NPCs? I think not. Why doth they stand like that? Aren't they guarding the cave? Oh no, their sigs all match. What does that mean? Peachbutt asked. They're RMTs. What? You don't know what RMTs are? I know what they are. She doesn't. She pointed to the sky. RMTs stands for Real Money Traders. They're usually people in Korea or China, sweating over computers 20 hours a day. They camp in front of rare monsters, wait for them to respawn and kill them for their items. Then they sell you the item in real life and give it to you here. None may pass where they set stakes, for their strength is unmatched from grinding day upon day. Peachbutt paused to roll her eyes. My player wants you to know that they sound like real meanies. Yeah, Cyril said. Damn it, do you know how many bunyips I had to kill to get the wolf key? Cyril felt a sudden series of jolts. Hey, hey, don't pound the keyboard, you'll overload me. We're all frustrated down here. A pox, Bulbadeer said. A pox on those parasites on the boils of society. Their grim countenances shall be... Yeah, yeah, Cyril nodded. You don't need to get all melodramatic on me. This land is not owned by them! Bulbadeer yelled and hoisted his axe. It belongs to all of us, for is not fairness of the trade our right and task? <sighs> Are you going to tell that to them? Cyril said. Even a seven-foot man with an ogre-killing axe couldn't win a battle with ten maxed-out warriors. Bulbadeer plunged his handle into the dirt and grunted in frustration. Oh, this lawless world brings forth a rage in my blood. I'm so sick of this. I get messages saying they're banning accounts. I get updated and patched till I can't tell where my original code is anymore. And then we still have this crap. Life is far from fair. I'm not asking life to be fair. I'm asking the game to be fair. Cyril sighed and waited for instructions. Guess we gotta go back. Maybe we can buy a topaz gem in the marketplace. We could sell the Thalassian grass and Phoenix Woman's contract. Hey! Cyril didn't even realize the override had been engaged when his legs started up the hill. Bulbadeer called out, Cyril, what vexes thee? What are you doing, player? I don't want to talk to them. It looked like his player intended to walk past the RMTs. Maybe they wouldn't do anything at all. Maybe they were just bots. Cyril made it within a foot of the cavern before the nearest one pulled out a pole arm and held it to the side, blocking the path. Cyril bounced against it and pawed it away, eyeing the RMT. We have claim? The Blood Knight said stiffly, as if a translator was doing the talking. No, Cyril spat back. You guys are just camping here. Why don't you give someone else a chance? Do you want Topaz Jim? We can sell it for you for 25 American dollar. Go to WW... No, I don't want to buy it. I want to earn it. I did the work to get to this monster. I did the leveling to fight it and win. Do you want a topaz gem? Oh, we can sell it to you for 25 American dollar. Go to... I'm not buying anything from you. A white beam of light shot out of the ground in front of Cyril, divided and spun around them, creating a circle around the two. Cyril shouted to his player. What are you doing? You're starting a PvP. Are you insane? I detect insult. Aggressive behavior will not be tolerated, the RMT said. He stepped forward, holding his polearm across his chest. Cyril didn't see too many options anymore. Escape was impossible in PvPs, and the arena ring was impenetrable by outside or inside forces. He had no choice but to attack. Fortunately, his cleric speed allowed him to make the first action. Cyril withdrew his dagger and shouted, 
Winding Thrust! Winding Thrust was a new ability that combined magic and strength. It was so powerful, he could only do it once a day. Pools of pinkish magic energy sparkled around Cyril as he darted to the left and dove forward. He held the dagger over his head like an axe, then sliced it across the RMT's chest. It made 188 points of damage. Cyril smiled, thinking that was a pretty good hit. The Blood Knight held his lance to the sky. A spiral of effervescent magic power absorbed into the tip. The RMT thrust the spear forward with a burst of yellow energy. The last thing Cyril saw, before everything went black, was the number 3,846. When he came to, he was back in bed in his safe house staring up at the ceiling. He felt tired, a little weaker, but mostly embarrassed. Jeez, what happened? Cyril asked. Dude, you took on an RMT. What did you expect? Peach Butt and Bulbadeer were hovering over his bed. I'm not in the graveyard? I give you a Phaedra tale, Peach Butt said. Had to warp you out of there before you croaked. And... My player says, you look really cute sleeping. Had our irons been forged as much as our hearts, we would have conquered our foes. I personally would have sliced them from gizzard to gullet. Thanks, Bulbadeer. Cyril sat up and checked his stats. Where's my chest plate? Your foe seized it as a reward. Ugh. Cyril grunted. An RMT could sell it for 50 bucks. Damn! He swung his legs out of the bed and rubbed his face. His health was full, but there was no item to heal his ego. Player, contact a game judge, Cyril said. He received an acknowledgement and felt the message go through. Be that wise, Bobadir said. They do not seem to be in a merry mood these days. I don't care. This is something they're supposed to take care of. This is supposed to be a fair game. He got off the bed. Meanwhile, I've got to find something to replace my armor. Want to go to the marketplace? Sounds good. My player can't get enough shopping in a day. Cyril opened the door and saw a giant black armored knight standing in his doorway. The game judge. He stood with his hands on his hips. Hail, Avatar. A fine day to you. Blah, blah, blah. What do you want? Uh, uh... Cyril couldn't think for a minute. Staring face to face with an overpowered warrior holding a sword as big as him made him forget what he wanted in the first place. How did you get here so fast? Apparently you don't know what the term game judge means. Game judge means I have total power. If I want to give you purple spots, I can do that. If I want to switch your arms and legs around, I can do that too. Now what's the problem? Uh, there... Oh, there are RMTs at the cave for the Serpent Dragon? Yeah, and? And are you going to do something about it? What for? Cyril scowled at him. They're ruining the game for everyone else. They're breaking the rules. They're blocking anyone from getting to the Serpent Dragon. The game judge shrugged. The Serpent Dragon? You haven't fought him yet? I'm trying to get a topaz gem. Just buy one? I don't want to buy one. I want to earn one fairly. Look, do you really want to annoy someone like me with your petty problems? Cyril didn't know which response would keep his neck and head together. But you're a game judge. You're supposed to enforce the rules. Isn't this against the rules? What rule are they breaking? It's not illegal to stay in one place for a long time. Not illegal for anyone to want to defeat a serpent dragon. They're camping. The Serpent Dragon's no match for someone at level 75. There ain't no law against running over an ant with a steamroller. You know they're just trying to harvest items to sell. That's the real world's problem, not mine. They're making the game unfair. That's why there are so many wandering avatars these days. Their players never logged back in because it wasn't fun anymore. Because of things like this. Look, son, there's always going to be RMTs. We kill a hundred, they come back with a thousand. As long as there are assholes who don't want to wait for anything in life, there will be someone to sell it to them. 
We could wipe a thousand avatars, they'll still come back with new ones. Enough said. Anything else you want to complain about? Or do you want to get fed to a dragon? Cyril opened his mouth, struggling for something to say. But he'd used up all his arguments and just shook his head. The game judge nodded. Next time, don't bug us judges. It's just a game. Lighten up. He disappeared in a flash of light. Cyril closed the door to his house. Wow, that was harsh. I hate this. I feel like I'm an NPC again. No power to do anything, and I'm sick of it. If only someone could kill those guys. Bulbadeer looked puzzled. Cyril, those are words of courage, but their truth is fallacy. Those RMTs might as well be invulnerable. They've got the best armor, best weapons, just like... She sighed. <sighs> Just like Chrissy at school, who's apparently very proud of her Prada backpack. Isn't Prada the potion maker in Gahannesburg? Look, Cyril turned up to his player. If the game judge can't do anything about it, then let's just buy a topaz gem. I mean, really, what were you doing engaging in RMT and PvP? Their stats are maxed out, and they have crystal spears and relic armor. You'd need a party of a hundred to take on all of those guys. I can't believe you got a party of a hundred people. I know. It took my player ten straight days, 270 emails, and three sacrifice dinners. He talked to people from Indonesia, South Africa, Germany, and Saudi Arabia. He emailed everyone in the school directory, including parents and teachers. Plus, he got in an argument with his parents that almost got his account cancelled. Cyril had never seen so many avatars at the flagpole. They mulled about like a cocktail party, sharing tips, bragging about their latest menial accomplishments, level raises, or spells obtained. I have counted fewer than a hundred, Bulbadir said at his side. Be that enough? Cyril sighed. It better be. We've got some high levels here looking for a challenge, so that's good. Oh god, no. My player wants me to make a speech. You've gotta be kidding me. He mumbled as he hoisted himself up on a tree stump. Attention, everyone! He shouted and waved his arms. Thank you all for coming. I hope you're all prepped and ready. A collection of fists pumped in the air and shouted, encouraging Cyril to keep going. Today, we're going to make a stand for all players over the world. That we're not going to take the abuse of the system lying down. This is a world for everyone. A world where we all work together to build a community. And it should be fair. If some people... Um, Cyril? Cyril looked down at Peach Butt. What? I have to go. My player says her parents are telling her to get off the computer. What? You're one of our primary healers. I know, but last time they took away her TV for a week. And she couldn't watch Jazzy Girls. You're passing up the Battle of the Century for Jazzy Girls? Sorry. Peach Butt walked away heading back into the forest. Cyril turned back to the crowd, deflated. Let's go do this! He jumped off the stump and headed in the direction of the cave with an army of soldiers behind him. The same ten RMTs were standing at the cave mouth, like royal guards. They did not react to the sight of a horde of rebels riding over the hill. Split up! Remember your assignments! Engage the enemy! Cyril shouted. The set of 90-odd players divided among the ten targets. Every group had at least three times as many members as a basic party needed. Each could probably take out a final boss in five minutes. But these opponents were way beyond that. Each of the RMTs responded in synchronization. They were caught unawares but not unprepared, and unleashed their strongest attacks first. 
Cyril saw a level 10 knave disintegrate in one cast of Moon Bonanza. Cyril called out, Cast Resurrection! Someone cast Resurrection on him! Before he could finish the phrase, someone did. Cyril was shocked. People were listening to him. Man down in group three. We have a man down in group three. Someone said. I'm on it. Use that amulet of Zovarax. Cast white area carapace. Got it. Sending. I'm generating a buff for group nine. As Cyril hacked away at his opponent, his consciousness flooded with status updates and messages. When someone needed to be healed, he got someone to do it. When someone had been poisoned, he found someone with an antidote. When an avatar was fatigued, he told someone to step up. They had been locked in combat for 20 full minutes, and no one had been killed yet, which was an accomplishment itself. He couldn't tell if they were winning, but they were holding their own. We got one, a mage rogue said. Cyril saw the black light of an avatar death shoot over the heads of nine people. He held his breath. If one of the other Blood Knights was going to resurrect him, he had 30 seconds to do so before he would be warped to the graveyard. 30 seconds went by, and the prone body disappeared. Of course, Blood Knights were meant for a single purpose, attacking. They had no healing items, no magic spells. Not only that, but they didn't care enough about each other to help. They were too focused on their own battles. However, the death brought the RMTs to their senses, and they started fighting like they meant it. They switched to more suitable weapons and armor for fighting avatars, and cast defensive spells instead of using pure attack strength. We're losing more men, Cyril heard. The party member's stats started to decline. They couldn't heal fast enough to do damage without being overpowered. The RMT Cyril was fighting unsheathed the glowing yellow sword and swiped it horizontally. Cyril jumped back but it slashed through the mercenary nearest him for instant death. No one could heal him before he fell to his knees and disappeared. Now, instead of fighting to win, they were just trying to stay alive. Hold together, people! We can still do this! Even Cyril couldn't believe his words, and he silently cursed his player for bringing him into this. Blood Knights were still dying, but for every one they killed, six of them fell. I'm out of items! Me too. We'll have to ignore healing if we're going to get them. Cyril thought this would be a slaughter, but not on both sides. If even one RMT was left, they would have failed. Then that's what we do, he said to the others. Fight! Keep fighting! Don't worry about healing! We've got their backs against the wall! Don't let up! Cyril caught the sword coming at him out of the corner of his eye and held up his dagger to block. While pushing against the blade, he looked behind him to scope the situation. The RMT being attacked by Bulbadeer's party, the only other one remaining, raised his spear, charging up a special attack. Look out! It's an AoE! Cyril shouted. Bulbadeer heard the warning and lumbered away as the wave of magic spread out in a runic circle. The eight others surrounding him collapsed from the area effect. Foul beast! Taste my steel! Bulbadeer lunged forward with a speedy special technique, plunging his axe into his foe. The RMT sagged back, defeated. Cyril's foe brought his weapon around and targeted the dwarven warrior behind him. With a sharp poke, he fell into a heap. It was just him and Bulbadeer left to defeat this last RMT. Cyril dodged the next attack. His HP was so low, a normal blow might kill him, let alone any special attacks. Bulbadeer shouted, Yonder, Cyril! Fearless leader, where art thou? Over here! Cyril shouted. Given his current resources, Cyril could never finish him one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't have enough health left to endure more than one blow. But the two of them together could do it. I'm coming, squire! Bulbadeer scraped up his axe. Energy glowed around him as he hoisted the weapon high over his head, glinting off the artificial sun. Cyril smiled. If he could let Bulbadeer charge an attack, that would be enough to finish the last RMT. Cyril danced around with his dagger, using his cleric speed to avoid being hit. Bulbadeer hurtled forward like a Viking berserker, primal savagery in his eyes. 
The RMT heard the roars behind him and saw a maniac rushing down the hill with a gigantic axe. I will bathe in the blood of my enemies. My axe will rain blows onto your skull and release you to a land beyond human suffering. Dishonorable scum! Cyril liked to think the RMT's eyes widened in surprise and fear, but the helmet obscured his face. He couldn't believe they were actually going to win. Your days of terror are at an end. None shall pass before my bl- Bulbadier paused in mid-step, his axe above his head, frozen. Did someone cast a spell on him? His body became a vapid blue outline, a blink of snowy static, then winked out of existence. Bulbadier has disconnected from the game. Oh, crap, Cyril muttered and turned back to the RMT. He raised his pole arm over his head and gathered magic energy into it. Cyril held up his arm, waiting for the impending blow. He hoped they wouldn't recycle him into an MPC stable cleaner. Hey, 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 what the hell is going on here? The Blood Knight and Cyril stopped and looked toward the cave's mouth for the source of the voice. A game judge walked out. Jesus Christ, you're slowing the server down. There must be like a hundred people in the same area. Do you know how much lag you're making? Cyril didn't know what to say, but the Blood Knight turned away from him and moved towards the game judge. What's this? A level 75 Blood Knight with complete armor? That's awful suspicious, don't you think, Mr. Dret 49585849? Shucky darned, you wouldn't happen to be an RMT, would you? See, I told you. Shut up, kid, the judge said. The Blood Knight brought out a Mega Life Juice and drank it. It was a rare item that restored all his HP instantly. Then he pointed his spear at the game judge. Oh, we have claim? Oh, aggressive behavior will not be tolerated. The game judge laughed in his hollow armor. <laughs> oh, that's cute. You're challenging me? I like that. He snapped his fingers. Serpy, if you please. <laughs> a no, white blur right came here. down on the RMT's upper body and snatched him up like a fish on a line. Cyril uttered a girlish shriek and crab crawled away. The serpent dragon shook the body in its jaws like a doll. Then, with a whip of its snake-like neck, spit him back out, slamming him on the ground. The RMT bounced like a ball. The number 58,579 appeared in white over his corpse, which promptly vanished. Holy mackerel, Cyril said. The serpent dragon lowered its opal head closer to the ground and stared at him with beady sapphire eyes. Its snout was wide and flat like a wyvern, with two tiny nostrils expanding and contracting with breath. The rest of its body was burrowed within its grotto. Not bad, kid. He took on all those gold sellers and lived. Someday you will earn this topaz gem. He patted the wyvern's cheek. <sighs> but it won't be today. The dragon retracted its long, scaled neck back into the darkness of the cave and disappeared. The judge said, Go home, kid. Get some rest. No problem there. My player's been online since four in the morning. The game judge snapped his head back, startled. Four in the morning? Geez, kid, get a life. It's only a video game. Logged out. Author's Note Hi, I'm Eric Juno. Thanks for listening to Playable Character. As you might guess, I'm a big video gamer, although I don't get to play too much anymore. Working kids and all that. One of the inspirations behind Playable Character was the increasingly advanced AI that some games are starting to exhibit. Games like Seaman and Project Natal's Milo and Kate that let you interact with intelligent personalities. It also comes from an article on Cracked.com, the 12 awesomest games of 2010, where David Wong hypothesized about a game where the person you control may or may not respond to your directions, depending on how many times you may have accidentally dropped him in the lava pit. That seems to be where some video games are heading, creating an autonomous character who you don't manipulate through controls and buttons, but through commands and suggestions. The dichotomy between a player and his or her avatar, the controller versus the controlled, 
someone who lives the life of the controlled, was what sparked this story. Welcome back, folks. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Okay, so this year you're going to do ride? I don't know. I used to make fun of the people at the amusement park that I'd go to when I was younger because they would always say that at the end. they go, welcome back. As if we'd gone somewhere. You know what I mean? We went around in a circle. Spinny rides. But yeah, there's spinny rides that don't go anywhere and they would still say, welcome back. And enjoy the rest of your stay here at Great America. So it was not a very good amusement park? No, it was good. They just said welcome back for some reason, which I thought was really dumb. Huh. So do you have any love for like the little amusement parks that come through for like one week in the summer and then they go? You know, we have one that comes through our town every year and I have, I don't have like a nostalgia for it because I never, I mean, I think they even came through my town when I was a kid, but I never had money so I didn't ever go to them. But my kids, I've taken to them many times. We pretty much go and blow 20 bucks or whatever at it every year. It's not like me looking back at when I was a teenager and hanging out at the county fair or whatever that you might have as a memory since you grew up in a hick town. But I still think they're cool. And I've read several of your stories that you've written that are based on actual experiences I'm willing to bet. Uh, yeah, it gives me that a little bit of uh, sentimentality for those things. None of which has anything to do with Eric's story. Uh, yeah, And unfortunately, we're now out of time. Uh, Eric, thank you for sending it. Good night, everybody. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. For... How many times have we done that lame joke? I don't know, but I can guarantee you this is not the last. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's let's talk about the story. First of all, let's talk about the title of the story. <laughs> yeah, Playable Character was not the original title of this story. Now, this was not previously published. No. Oh, hey, this, yeah, this is... this was his first sale. How about that? I think it's great. Uh, and it's I mean, a great I, story. For... I feel bad that we're <laughs> who we sold it to because nobody will ever, ever hear it. But <laughs> he's welcome to shop it around again now. Yeah, true. Damn, this was fun to record. <laughs> it was. Yeah, this story wasn't called Playable Character to begin with. It was actually titled Avatar. Huh. Well, and I wonder why he would change it. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I saw that and, and and I knew that it would be somewhere near New Year's time that we finally got around to getting his story out. And I thought, you know, Eric, you might want to consider there's this film by this guy named James Cameron. Maybe you've heard of him and it's going to probably be a big deal right about this time. Maybe you might want to consider something else. And he said, you know, I never thought of that. And so he picked something else and went with playable character instead. And it was all for nothing. Nobody went and saw Avatar. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal at oh. all. Sorry, Eric. Who knew? You know, a playable character is a more distinctive title anyway. It's, it's a more fun title, and I think it's better for the story. It works. This was one of those stories that I first read back when I was uh, on my vacation in Canada, and I just printed out a whole load of stories and took them all with me and read through them as I uh, had all my spare time in the backwoods farmland that I was in. You know, there wasn't a lot to do, so that's what I did. And No, yeah, no amusement parks there? No, no amusement parks at all. They didn't even get the fare coming through town. Or So I was reading that story, and I read the first bit, and I was like, oh. Because I think we've had a few that were sent in that were fantasy stories, but set in video game fantasies. And I just thought, oh, dude, I, I don't like these kind of stories. But I went ahead and read it. And I went in with a negative mindset to begin with, which is usually something that's hard to overcome, you know, when you expect to hate something. But he totally won me over. I was probably five or six pages in. I was just like, gosh, this story's great. And I was smiling the whole way through it. And I sent it off to you and said, hey, here you go. You know, I expected to hate this story. And yet it turns out that I absolutely loved it. So what do you think? And I think you felt the same way. Well, it's surprising. Had I read the story first, I would have sent it to you and said, you know, you probably won't respond to the story in the same way that I did. Because I have played world of warcraft i had an account for a little while did i fall asleep for a little while r.i.p dollhouse and um it was a really fun game a giant time waster not not as bad as facebook but similar 
But yeah, I, I related to it. The gaming community and the, especially the online massive multiplayer, everybody has experienced something similar. And uh, I don't know, I guess this is what the next generation of that. Uh, but now, uh, you never played World of Warcraft? No, I was having sex in high school. Uh, I have to retire that along with old man stories and ending the episode halfway through. Or... No? No, you know. Yes and no. You know, I actually never have played World of Warcraft. I've played games that would be like it, but I've never played one of those online games where tons and tons of people the world around are playing. The closest I ever came to that was when I was a teenager, and this was back before the internet was actually invented. No more old man stories. <laughs> they had these things that they called bulletin boards, or BBSs. And you basically would call someone's computer and you would log straight into it and he would have some crap loaded up there so that you could get on and play games. And these were all like text-based games and I would play this game that was called Trade Wars. It was a space trading game where you tried to get money and become a big trading space captain. But of course it was a local thing, you know, you could, had to call. So you weren't going to call somebody long distance with your computer and spend a half hour paying long distance rates to play this stupid game with somebody else in Sacramento if you live somewhere else. So it wasn't a large community kind of thing. There was 30 or 40 people, maybe. But uh, that's the closest my experience has been. And since then, you know, I've been having sex, so... You could have just said no. I think my first exposure to World of Warcraft was I worked at a call center and our shift manager or supervisor or whatever you want to call it would sit at his desk and play World of Warcraft. And he was paid more than we were to play World of Warcraft. And I would go over and I would watch him run around and fight and gain experience and a bigger paycheck than mine. And uh, his body was never found. No, actually, I was impressed that he could get away with this kind of shite. Because, you know, if I checked my email from my console, it would raise a red flag somewhere. <laughs> There'd be a shadow looming over me, and I'd turn around and giant pink slip with arms. Yikes. But I think it was because of that, and I got into World of Warcraft just for a short time that year. Really enjoyed it, but what I didn't have was a group of friends that all got on at the same time. Right. And we get together and we, we look forward to going on quests together. And that and so many of the quests on the actual game require other people. And if you don't have friends... Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> um, online at the same time as you, then you have to go up to strangers and ask, would you mind going to help me find this ring? Which is what our hero in the story does. He recruits everybody he can possibly recruit for his massive war. Have you read a fair number of Cory Doctorow stories or just a couple? I've never read anything, let alone <laughs> Cory Doctorow. I, well, I, Cory Doctorow does if, it. If he had us do a story on our show, uh -huh. that I would read. Because you had to. No, 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 just... Because that's what we do. We read it out loud. Cory, why, why? Did he send us a story? Not necessarily, but that's beside the point anyways. Uh, Cory Doctorow does do a podcast where you can listen to him reading his stories. And uh, he has a story that's called Anda's Game. He does a whole thing where he has fun lifting titles from famous sci-fi stories. So that's one of those where he's lifted Ender's Game. But it's about someone kind of similar to this. Someone who is playing a role-playing game. And there's people that have ruined it. And it, it, it's really interesting. To tell you the truth, I think this story takes Cory Doctorow's story one better. And, and, and it's more fun. But then again, Cory Doctorow's story is all about social, economic, activism... <laughs> he has a tendency to uh, try and say something important with his story. You'd never catch me saying something important in my story. If you haven't heard that story before, if you've never read anything in your life, like someone in the room, Announce go them, over I'm and disappointed <laughs> in you. Uh -huh. Go over and check that out. Take a look at that. You can get it from his podcast. It's funny because it's true, folks. There are people that ruin it for everybody else the south park world of warcraft episode is all about somebody that gets on and he's hostile to the other characters and, and i think that's something that you're going to get 
any time you, you interact with strangers. There uh-huh. are people that get off on ruining other people's fun. Anything online, you're going to have some version of a troll yeah. involved. Why do you think I'm a troll? I, I just wanted it to look like me. Is that more Heath Ledger as the Joker? Or does that sound like <laughs> Moses? is like? At first, when I read Bulbadier's dialogue, the, all the all the crap that he says, that is just so effed up and wrong. Um, that's what, that's actually one of my pet peeves that I have when it comes to characters named Bulbadier. I, I yeah, I no. Uh, when people use that old time type language where they try and write a fantasy story and they have the character saying, the art, my friend, drives me crazy because very few people can get that old time stuff correct. So many people just screw up again and again and again. It just irritates the crap out of me. And so... When I first saw this stuff, I was thinking, oh, no, it's another person who's screwed this up. But later when we read it, I realized just how absolutely funny the stuff that he was saying was. There were so many times where you you were reading through some dialogue of Bulbadier's and you just couldn't even make it all the way through because you would find yourself laughing. It was really a brilliant uh, bit of writing by Eric in that uh, character. Yeah, hey, tell me a little bit about how the story was edited together and the other people that are doing voices. Oh, right. Yeah. Brian Lincoln was uh, the producer on this episode. And he went out and actually got World of Warcraft players that uh, he knew. And they wanted to be credited by their World of Warcraft names oh, they for, did. for their voice. So that's what was going on before. <laughs> when you yeah. said something like lightning hoof, and I thought... <laughs> Yeah, but Brian made up some of his own sound effects. He, he did. actually uh, did some fencing. I, I think it was really cool. Brian has really helped us out, man. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it just every week sounds the same to the people listening. Yeah, I wonder. If they can tell the style or whatever. But it's always a treat when he's done an episode because, A, it's a surprise <laughs> yeah. how it's going to turn out because, you know, he gets strangers to do. Yeah. In Big this surprise case. to me because normally it's me editing through. So I've already heard the episode a hundred times before it actually hits the air. And then, too, he has different sensibilities. He has different things that he might stress than you do or than I uh-huh. would. And so, yeah, I'm sure the end result is very different than if you had done it or if it had been the one out of 20 stories that I do. So thank you, Brian. And hopefully Eric will send out his stories to everybody but us, and we will die. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, hopefully we will die. No, no, no. Hopefully Eric will send out his stories all over the place, and uh, he'll become this big famous dude, and uh, we'll know him when. Yeah, but will be able to say, we were his first sale, dang it. Yes, the long defunct. Doonsty Fiction Magazine, hosted by the late Rich Outfield. <laughs> also, hopefully he will send us another story, too. Yeah. And now it's time for, what is this? We have something waiting in the wings, ready to hit the air. So maybe we'll just uh, draw this to a close. What do you think? All right. It's not a bad idea. 08OT's got it ready to play. So uh, 08OT, roll that beautiful piece of stuff. Stuff it is. <laughs> we will open up the vault to a. I, I think you're in for a treat, folks. But uh, you can take that with a grain of salt because it's <laughs> it's me we're talking about here. But uh, go ahead and, and roll that. All right, OT. Hey, roll that, O eight OT. You're nothing more than a GoBot, Megatron. <laughs> How dare you? So hey, Big, do you remember when we did on the origin of sounds? I do. And. Uh, Go on. For, for those that don't remember okay. or didn't bother to listen, what's wrong with you? Go back. These stories are free. Right, right. Can you hear me fine? I can, as long as you're talking to the mic. Okay, so On the Origin of Sounds was a story about a man who was diagnosed with an irrational fear right. of dwarfs. Yes, they're And scary. that prompted... Scary, those dwarfs. Right. That prompted a discussion about our own irrational fears. Of which uh, you had none, I recall. <laughs> we later discovered that I had a few. Oh, I, of like dark shapes under the water. Right? right. Yeah, here and there. Did you have another one besides dark shapes in the water? Well, cockroaches I had to agree with you on as well. Okay. That's cool. They're just creepy beyond understanding. Oh, yeah, I agree. But 
<laughs> Enough about you. In that episode, we asked our listeners to uh, provide us with their own irrational fears right. in the comments section. The result was, well, it was impressive, man. It was record setting. Yes, it's the most we've ever had commented on it. By episode. a long ways. By my tally, there were a total of three different people posting in the comments <laughs> wow. section. Wow. And that's one more than we have listeners. Wow. So I thought we'd do a follow-up episode where I list some of the irrational fears that people wrote down. And then okay. we can comment on whether we share that fear. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so number one, butterflies. <laughs> Fearsome creatures. No, I, I must admit, no, butterflies are not one of my fears. No, not me either. Okay, number two, ballerinas, especially sexless European ones. I'm, are there sexless European ones? Doesn't every male ballerina have a gigantic bulge showing through in those little tights? Have you ever seen? I think ballerina is a feminine word. Oh, okay. I guess that's. Have you ever seen Hot Shots where they go to the ballet and all the ballet guys, whatever ballerinos, whatever they may be called, ballerinos, they, they have these gigantic bulges sticking out of their tights to the point where at the end they actually have one of the dancers dance across by stepping on each guy's bulge as he goes down the line. Ah! Oh, good stuff. Anyway, sorry. No, I'm not afraid of ballerinas, I must admit. <laughs> okay, me either. Uh, number three, the movie Mulholland Drive. <laughs> Have you seen that? I don't think so. It was a David Lynch movie. It introduced the world to uh, Naomi Watts. Hmm. I haven't seen it either, sorry. I think I've heard the title, but it doesn't scare me. It sounds scary. like a rather suburban movie to me. Well, yes, but it's David Lynch. so Right, that does make it creepy. Number four, Mixed Martial Arts, a.k.a. the World (laughs) Fighting Championship and its ilk. (laughs) Oh, good times, good times. No fear there? Okay, number five, people who angrily defend Mixed Martial Arts. (laughs) Okay, number six, people whose name is Nigel. Oh, I'm sorry, this wasn't one of the fears, but rather one of the posters is named Nigel. Oh. Well, we might as well treat it as a fear. Okay. I, at times, I'm afraid of people named Nigel, but not irrationally. Fair enough. <laughs> Number seven, Bratz dolls. I am deathly afraid of Bratz dolls. Holy crap. It's like a Barbie doll, but twisted and evil beyond understanding. Yikes. <laughs> Bratz doll. My gosh. See, I just friggin' hate them, but yeah, there's no fear. <laughs> they're so scary, those eyes. They're like alien, freakish eyes, and they have these gigantic heads, but yet normal-sized bodies. Yeah, they're really twisted. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, number eight, hissing cockroaches. <coughs> now, this was something I think Abby mentioned. She'd said... They hiss? They hiss? Holy I- crap! Can you imagine? They're not bad enough. They hiss? You know, once I actually saw a cockroach flying. Did you know the cockroaches? There must be certain breeds or something that can fly. Maybe they all can. I, I don't know. They're beetles of some sort, right? Don't, I don't all think beetles all of them fly? Can. No. Holy crap. And this one that I saw flying, it sounded like a hummingbird taking off. It was like trying to get off the ground. The thing was huge. It was as big as your fist, I swear. Well, see, that's a fear that we both share is yes, the cockroach thing. Cockroaches are scary. But I, I don't know. I think flying cockroaches to me are less scary than the skittering ones that might go onto your shoe or up your pant see, leg. The flying cockroach can go from the ground to your face without having to crawl up your leg. Wow. You know, it's funny. Uh, just the other day, I was out with a friend of mine and his wife... I think they were talking about, like, younger children watching R-rated movies. And out of the blue, she says, have you guys ever seen Creepshow? (laughs) I was like, ah, I saw that when I was, like, eight at my friend's birthday party, and I was scared of it forever. She did the same thing, apparently. She's like, oh, yeah, I remember the part at the end when the cockroaches come out of his nose and his mouth. (laughs) It's like, wow. It's funny that I just finished making an episode of the show about that, and there we are, talking about it again with a new person that's never even heard it. Why has she never heard the podcast? Because nobody listens to it. Not even people you know. No. Especially not people I know. 
I make sure that I don't tell them that I have a podcast because they might listen to it. And then they might learn all sorts of things about me, like that I'm scared of brat stalls and so forth. There you go. Christmas is coming up, folks. (laughs) Okay, number nine, tipping vehicles. The idea that your car could flip over onto its side. Hmm. You know, I'm not scared of tipping vehicles, but that brings to mind something that really does kind of freak me out is being in a vehicle that, like, falls into a deep body of water. Because you can't just get out of a car when it's in, like, a river or whatever and sinking. I don't know why exactly that is, but it's just, like, not easy to get out of a car when it's submerging like that. So just opening the door and climbing out is not necessarily possible. I don't know. So that kind of freaks me out, but that's off the subject, I guess. Well, we used to go camping a lot in my dad's old truck, and it was a 72 Ford, and he still has it. Can you imagine? (laughs) There would just be these dirt roads or these mountain roads, and I would be in the back of the truck or in like in the little trailer, and yeah, the angle would be so sharp that I was (laughs) sure that we would tip over. And we never did. As far as I know, we never even came close. But in the back, I was Felt sure like we were just dead. You know, kind of that, thing. Yeah, that could be a little so freaky. So I think I share her fear on that. If, if there's a large hail like on one side or something like that, yeah, that could, that could make you a little nervous. Just looking down and thinking, wow, we'll roll for a long time before we stop. Okay, number 10, John and Kate plus eight. <laughs> My wife used to watch that all the time. Before John went mental or whatever he did. I don't really know. Any. They have eight kids. I think they were mental from the beginning. <laughs> I didn't follow it. I just know that every day on TMZ.com TV show. They have a TV show, TMZ. They do? Yeah. And every now and then on that show, you'll see like the douchebag alert or whatever it is. And they talk about what the douchebag John, whatever his name is, has been doing recently. I think the douchebags are the people who follow their misadventures. I, <laughs> You're dude, right. How, in what universe, what kind of bizarro, backward-speaking square planet do we live in where people give a crap about John and Kate? And, <laughs> and you know, they give a crap about them they do. like they do the fudge and vice president of the United No, there's way more John and Kate oh, shite yeah, than there is far. about anybody. Especially the fudge and vice president. I mean, nope. yeah, name sorry him, about name Biden. Him. Joe Biden. Oh, good job. Hen, you're the one in 10 that can actually even come up with that. It was hard. We had to pause the tape for 15 <laughs> minutes and I wikipedia it. But uh, you look and they were on the cover of every magazine. And not just the, the bloody tabloids, but it's like Scientific American, <laughs> Team Beat. Asimov's? Yeah. Dude, how did that happen? <laughs> All right. Uh, number 11. That Big's wife has the DVD collections of John and Kate plus eight. <laughs> You know, that does scare me, I'm afraid. Everything scares the crap out of you, though. Yeah, but I think there's something valid about that. You know what? She just rented from Netflix the other day. Ugly Betty, season two. That at least has writers. That at least has actors. Salma Hayek has some tangential. If you loved Ugly Betty, then you'll love Fugly Benji. Thank you, sir. I use your words against you. All right, uh, number 12, fish. Fish. Not fish on a plate, but fish in a stream or an aquarium. Well, that kind of goes along with what I said before about how I would just freak out when I'm in deep water and I've got that kind of fear of feeling something brush against my leg. And, and, you know, you can't see your feet even when you're in like a lake or something like that. You look down and it's just kind of dark. That kind of freaks me out, fish in a stream. Not in an aquarium so much. Well, we had this guy, I guess, I don't know, something about the scales or the way they move really disturbed him. But that's why it's irrational, you know? It's yeah. Because, okay, well, I went snorkeling one time and it was mm-hmm. just amazing. And there were all these great big black fish that would swim up and nip at me, like my hands <laughs> and stuff. And that didn't disturb me in any way, but just the thought, the very idea that you would see a shark approach. Uh-huh. And, and that just... I, and I did nipping. It no, takes... I just even seeing one, the the water <laughs> would, would turn green you'd have around your me. pants. Uh, when I was younger, I went snorkeling as well. We went to the Bahamas with my parents, and they were talking about, yeah, we're gonna put you in by this uh, reef, and there's always a whole lot of fish there. Be careful though, because there's these plants down there that you sh- you don't want to touch because. If you touch them, you know, they'll sting you a little bit. And this guy was giving us all these warnings as he prepared us for this. 
And then my stepmom's like, I'm not going in there. Forget it. <laughs> All those warnings were good enough to keep her right out of there. And we hopped in there, and yeah, fish swimming right in your face all over the place was pretty cool. <laughs> I've never killed a man with my bare hands, but until that day comes, I think the whole snorkeling experience is one of the best of my oh. life. Okay, uh, number 13, people with one eye one color and the other eye a different color. Dude, I think that's awesome myself. I wish that I was one of those people. So that's not something that scares you? Anyway. No. A little bit me, yeah. You're scared of everything, though. we got a long list. You're you scared of people with one eye one color and the other eye also that color. <laughs> That's not right, man. It's just... Ugh. Okay, uh, number 14, Jack in the Boxes, the toy. <laughs> I'm more scared of the restaurant. Number 15, Jack in the Boxes, the restaurant chain. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Actually, dude, I love Jack in the Box. I don't actually eat there, but their commercials are so frigging brilliant. With the Jack right, guy. Right, with the Jack guy and all this. Oh, they're so funny. I was sad when I moved away from California. Because you can't see those commercials. Yeah, I don't anymore. see them anymore. I'm almost willing to go on YouTube and search just so that I can watch commercials for a restaurant that I can't visit. You want to do that instead of finishing this list? Because that sounds like fun, Wait, huh? have you ever had a taco at Jack in the Box? Their no. tacos suck. All man. their food basically sucks. I don't know what the deal is with that, but Ooh. their commercials are brilliant. Okay, uh, number 16, Mini Coopers. You know, those annoying little cars uh -huh. that you find in affluent neighborhoods. Uh-huh. The ones that you find on the Italian Job movie. Yeah, one time I was mentioning the Italian Job to a friend of mine. He's like, Italian Job? That wasn't a movie. That was just a commercial for Mini Coopers. <laughs> I'm done. Move on. Number 17, men with comb overs. Yikes. That is pretty scary. You know, as far as I'm concerned, my own personal opinion, and you can completely reject this if you would like to, but you know, if you're going to go bald, go bald gracefully. There's many ways actually to try and fight it, and none of them really work out. Getting the plugs or whatever they get put in to try and give you new hair it doesn't work and it always looks scary but yeah you know i would just say grow old gracefully don't shave your head if you're going bald and try and pretend like you you're bald by choice because we can see that there's hair bristles on the side and none on the top people aren't fooled some guys look good bald like bruce willis looks good bald yeah he looks all right oh he looks more than all right buddy <laughs> oh sorry i didn't that's a it. handsome man just Keep your hair cut short. Don't try and grow it long and comb it over. Don't shave it. Just be a man. What about a hat? Wear a hat. Wear one of those fedoras or bowler hat or something cool like that. Well, well, last time you saw somebody with a bowler hat on. A Harry Potter movie is about it. Okay. Is, moving on? Sure. Number 18, ice cream with bubble gum in it. That is pretty scary. Although as a kid, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world for some reason. I did too, but now that just turns my oh, stomach. It's disgusting. I remember ice how it would be hard because yeah. it was cold. Ooh. There was an ice cream place right by my house that you walk across the park when I was growing up. And they had a big bubblegum ice cream flavor. And they would even give you a stupid little paper cup so you could spit the bubble oh. gums into this cup and save them for when you're done. But seriously, bubble gum sucks, and you can get it like five pieces for ten cents out of the stupid machine. Why would you want it in your ice cream? I think I heard a little bit of Christopher Walken just then. Why would you want it in your ice cream? It's disgusting. I'd be damned if I'm going to eat ice cream with bubble gum in it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. Number 19, going insane. I guess. I don't think that's an irrational fear, though. I'd be freaked out of going insane, I would suppose. No, I think it's just the fear of going insane. You know, it's just like, what if, what if I lost? My... You know, if you have a relative with Alzheimer's or somebody that was mentally mm, ill. That, or, yeah, you that know, could be a uh, big fear. Then I can understand that just being insane. What, I hope that doesn't happen yeah, to me. Yeah, being afraid. Freaking out every time you forget something or something like that. Oh, crap. Does that mean that I'm starting? Yeah, that's a valid fear for I me. I think so, but, but I, I'm not personally afraid of it yet, at least. I'm not old enough to that I've started forgetting too much. Ew, yeah. <laughs> okay, number 20. This is related. Not going insane, but everyone thinking you're insane. 
I'm not afraid of it again, but that could be really bad. What are you going to do if they've all pronounced you insane? <laughs> Which is worse, that you've actually lost your mind, but you don't know it because you're crazy. Right. Or you know you're sane and everybody insists that you're crazy. It almost seems like that would be worse. Yeah, I think that would be much worse because if you're insane, then you're probably blissfully unaware of the fact and you're just off in your own world or whatever. But you're not off in your own world if you're not insane, but they've thrown you in the insane asylum anyhow. You're right next to some guy who's painting frescoes with his own bung. (laughs) He's like, flush the toilet. Like, there's paints in it. All right. uh, Number 21, women with mustaches. That is a little scary. But, you know, everybody has issues here and there. Who am I to throw stones? You're a good man. Number 22. I mean, I sit here every week across from a woman with a mustache, so... Okay, number what? Your wife still looks pretty feminine, dude. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't referring to her. Number 22. Monchi cheese. Those are pretty scary. Funny, the other day I heard this comedian guy who was talking about the things that they just hate the most. And he was saying, you know, one of the things that I just can't stand is everybody thinks that like whatever was old and fun from when they were kids is cool now it's like no it isn't you know you like jelly shoes well they're not cool now monchi chi it's not cool now (laughs) i thought that was pretty funny that he pulled out monchi chis because seriously dude nobody even remembers that crap It's weird when some of those things come back, like that Monchi cheese. Well, like they're little, My Little Ponies everywhere. Now. Well, My Little Ponies were actually popular in the 80s, whereas Monchi Chi was like a six month fad tops. Damn. And it wasn't even a, a big fad, it was like a low level fad when it came through. But I can still sing the song to it. That's exactly what I was going to do. All right. Well, then I'm not <laughs> crazy. I'm not number 22. Um, You're not. Crazy? Uh, you'd be damned if you'd sang the Manchichi song. You make my Christopher Walken sound good. Thank yeah, you. I do, yes. I, uh, okay, I, sing it. Manchichi, Manchichi, oh, oh so soft and cuddly. That's, of course, all I know, but uh, yeah. Dear Lord. Oh, wait, OT. If you ask him, I'm sure he'll cut it. Oh, yeah, he always listens. Have you noticed he always cuts out whatever we ask? Uh, number 20. Wait, nobody does, actually. I, I'm, I've usually heard it all still in there. Really? Yeah, we might want to take a look at his programming. I've been saying that for months, man. Yeah. Just but... wipe it clean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, stuff. okay. Back to the list. Number 23, parasites. Particularly the stomach kind. Uh, I, You know, I guess I'm not really afraid. You know, I actually lived in South America for a while where parasites, the stomach kind are basically a way of life. I mean, it's just something everybody has. And, you know, you'd go to the bathroom and you just look and see if there's any worms in there crawling around. And uh, we would actually take parasite medicine every few months. And uh, something really creepy to go along with that is they said, make sure you take this pill first, then this pill. Because if you take them in the other order, apparently the the first pill was only strong enough to kill off some of the smaller worms that you would contract. And then the big pill would kill off the monster worms that, you know, are, are going to do you some serious harm. So if you took but, the wrong... Yeah, if you took the big pill first, they said... It would piss off the worm. It, the little worms would we'd be so freaky to get out and away from this big poison that they would come up up your throat and out your mouth you're lying i don't know if it's true but that's what they said i'll tell you that freaked me out just the idea of parasites the stomach kind coming up out of your throat and finding their way out your mouth that is enough to make me go number two in my pantaloons remember they used to always talk about you know, this guy that had the tapeworm, and, and so he just decided he would starve himself. And he didn't eat for days, and his stomach was constantly roiling. And, uh-huh. and then finally he got some raw meat, and he put it right by his mouth. And the worm and the th- actually came out after. Yeah, I've heard that too. Okay, uh, number 24, kids under 10 
who have cell phones. Yeah, that, that does freak me out a bit. Just people with cell phones sometimes bother me. Where did their minds go that made them act the way that they do once they have those things? I just don't get it. We went to the movies the other day, and you know how they try and come up with cleverer and cleverer promos right, at the beginning to, tell to try and to not use the phone and, during the movie. You know, just the stupid. What's the hedgehog's name? Happy, oh, yeah, the pantless hedgehog. Ha- happy hedgehog or whatever that I've seen a hundred and forty times. But all the money that they spend on that, and I remember the in in L.A. they had these great like movie parodies. Where it'd be like a really, really tense moment in a movie and then somebody's cell phone would go off in the audience and it would get the characters killed or, you know, whatever <laughs> it would happen. I like the ones where they had like Martin Scorsese and the person's like on the phone and then all of a sudden he comes out and he's like, no, 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 let's say this on the call and why don't you say it this way? And all. the lady's like, what are you? I'm just trying to call. It's like, is, is my directing interrupting your conversation? <laughs> right. That was actually a really good yeah, one because I, I remember he says to the kid... You can't even remember your father. You never knew him or whatever. It's just like, what? Daddy? Kind of thing, which is so great. Um, But anyhow, so they play all this crap and then they have the local screen that comes up in between the projection from their laptop and the actual projector. And it's just like, please silence or turn off cell phones now. And for some reason, the projector guy just forgot or, or didn't turn it on or anything like that. And it just sat. And a minute goes by. And then a minute and a half goes by and the audience is getting restless. And finally I yell, okay, who hasn't shut off their cell phone? And everybody (laughs) laughed and that was really funny. And a second later, the guy turned on the projector. So we were watching the movie and we're about five minutes after the credits and some idiot cell phone goes off two or three rows away. I mean, he heard me make the joke. He laughed. He saw that thing sitting there for two minutes saying, please turn it off. What is the deal with people? It's everybody feels like, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me or they're the exception or my calls are more important or it's okay for me to take because I'm not enjoying the movie. You know, it goes so far beyond just cell phones and movies, though. You know, and an interesting thing, Kevin Anderson, who we've done his stories of several times on on the show and but never again, never. Yeah, never again. But uh, he actually, I'm not sure exactly how he came by this, to tell you the truth, but I think he wrote a piece for his local newspaper. So there was a podcast that you could download of Kevin Anderson's article that he wrote for this local newspaper, and the article was called, Put Down Your Cell Phone and Be a Parent. Not like a parent, but a parent. (laughs) And he told this story of how he went to this park to play with his son at this park. And he's there and his son is playing. And there's several other kids there playing too. And every one of these other kids' moms is sitting on the bench, talking on their cell phone, ignoring their children. And the children are like, hey, mommy, look at me. And they can't be bothered to even spare some attention for them. And it was to the point where Kevin actually was said... That, you know, he would say, hey, good job, kid. You know, he didn't even know these people's kids, but he's playing the role of the parent for these kids because the friggin' parents are too busy talking on their cell phone to even acknowledge their kids as they play. It's a sad world sometimes, the cell phone thing. It just makes me upset. We could do a whole episode on cell phones because <laughs> I, I friggin' hate them. And, <laughs> and I honestly just, I, I've not been around that long. But I've been alive long enough to see the difference in way people act pre-cell phone and post-cell phone. The, 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 the idea of common courtesy – now, maybe it was gone when Woodstock happened or, or whatever it might be after the baby boom. But it's just that crap. Of, you know, you're in a line and some idiot is on their cell phone and they're in front of you and they don't move up or they're turned to the teller yeah. and it's their turn. But yet they, they're so engrossed in their conversation – and they don't give a poop about the rest of the people in the line behind them. Well, I'm trying not to curse. because <laughs> it's, it's coming across so well. Too. But it's just – the cell phones make me want to swear. And there yeah. are times that you're at the bank or whatever or Boy, the post you're... office, someplace you don't want to be. Right. And you're in a line and it's just like, please, I, the sooner I get out of here, the sooner I can die in my bed. And people are on their cell phones preventing that from happening. Yeah. Or when you're out driving and somebody does something really stupid and you always see that person that's done something stupid has got the damn cell phone in their hand and they're not paying attention to their driving. They say, studies have been done, people talking on cell phones and driving at the same time are as bad a driver as someone who is drunk. 
Oh, you know, there's some a hole that's going to say, "No, no, that does not apply to me. I can text, I can sing, I can be composing my email, I can be knitting, crocheting, doing my makeup, and driving a stick all at the same time, and I'm a better driver than you." It's just funny. Yeah, they, they say that it, strangely, and I don't understand why this would be, but it's apparently the case that uh, talking with someone that's in the car with you is a hundred times different than talking with someone on the cell phone for some reason. It is not distracting to talk to someone in a car. And actually, they say it can be helpful because those people can keep you awake or whatever might be your problem. Talking with someone on the cell phone is just completely distracting. It's as bad as eating something really sloppy that drips all over your shirt and distracts you really badly. Doing a line of coke while driving. Right. That, to me, that's always been really difficult. Right, yeah, that can be trouble. It was funny. Uh, I, I had to put on my brakes while I was driving. Then the jack-off behind me honked at me for having put on my brakes. Apparently that's not allowed. <laughs> and then, of course, I look over at this jerk, and they've got their cell phone to their ear. So obviously they weren't paying attention. They honked at me because they almost hit me because they weren't paying attention enough to see the brake lights come on. <laughs> okay, well, so going back to that list, kids under 10 who have cell phones. We haven't even really talked about that. Yeah, kids but... having them. My uncle in Vegas, he got held up at work and he didn't pick up his kid at the elementary school. And, and he was like a half hour late. Oh, geez. And the teacher was like, you know, we called your primary number and your <laughs> secondary number and nobody answered. And he's like, and she had to stay here after school. And he says, you know, it's, it's 335. And she's like, no, well, we didn't know if you had been killed or, you know, kind of thing. And he's just like, well... Hey, I'm sorry. Well, what what do you want me to do about it? And she says, obviously, your daughter should have a cell phone. Oh, and why? he said, she's nine. And and she's like, well, then you know you need to be more responsible as a parent. I, but, but I've been a, late to pick up my kid, and they just stick them in the office. Well, because it's life. That's the thing. It's everybody's going to be late at some point in a world where there's traffic or accidents or daylight savings time or whatever <laughs> it might be. Somebody is going to be late. I mean, it's not R-O-A-T driving to pick people up. You know, they're, they're humans with frailties and slips of the mind and all this. But anyway, the, to make this very long story short, he had to buy his nine-year-old a cell phone. And she showed it to us when we went to visit in Vegas. And she's like, oh, it has this song, it has this game, this app, and look, here's the camera and all that stuff. And just the way she was describing this toy to me, I knew she was way too young to have a cell phone. Yeah. And just the way that the kids lose things, leave them all over the house or can't keep track of them or keep care of them. They do have some cell phones that I've heard of where they – all sorts of restrictions on the thing basically to the point where you can't call anyone but your parents with the thing and et cetera. Dad, that's stupid. Yeah, I'm sure they would complain. But, you know, at least it would take care of the the teacher's complaint. All right. Well, I I just kind of needed to say that because – and then Lexi, my niece, said, well, Cammy has a cell phone, so I, I should be able to have one too. And it was just like it, – it is. It's the slippery slope that I'm talking yeah. about that's so ludicrous. Yeah. In this case, it's not ludicrous yeah. at all. That's why kids get like $10 for a friggin' tooth these days is because their friends got five or whatever. You know, you got to get keep up with the other kids. I'll loosen a couple more of you's <laughs> teeth right now, you little bastard. <laughs> I will try and get down through the rest of the list a lot faster. Okay, number 25, fat green tomato worms. You know, the funny thing is, you think you're going to get through the list faster, but you mentioned tomato worms, and I have a story that goes along with that. I'm not scared of tomato worms, strangely enough. Well, how about they, the ones with the horns on their tail? They just look like caterpillars or something like that, to me anyways. I mean, they weren't scary, but you know, when I was a kid, we had tomatoes in our garden or whatever. And my mom actually bribed me to get, maybe she was afraid of tomato worms, I don't know, but she bribed me to get all the tomato worms. She would actually give us a quarter for every tomato worm that we found. And me and my friend, we'd be like... You'd put them under your pillow and at night the tomato fairy would come. No. So me and my friend would be like, dude, let's go get a big gulp. And we're like, all right. So we'd go back (laughs) into the backyard and we'd find like five tomato worms. We'd get ourselves a buck and we'd head off and get a big gulp. And we used that like six or seven times that year to get spending cash, which I thought, you know, I love tomato worms just for that fact. See, now I grew up on a farm... 
and I would catch the tomato worms and feed them to our chickens. Oh, and cool. to me, that would be really fun because, you know, you'd like throw them up in the air and the chickens would like, and they'd dash after them and stuff. Uh-huh. But it may have been my incipient serial killer syndrome. Ah, in right yes. Now. They usually do start with yeah. animals and move on. Okay, number 26, really, really tall people. I mean, how tall is really, really, is this like Yao Ming tall? Or what is, counts as really, really Okay, if you really were standing tall. at a urinal and Yao Ming came up behind you and started fondling you. Okay, if he's fondling me, then I'm going to be very scared, yes. Okay, well, then you're afraid of talking. Okay, people. there you go. Number 27, stinging insects. I am a little, I'm scared of wasps. I'm not so scared of bees. I think it's because you know that a bee's got one sting and then it's dead or something, whereas wasps don't. And also, I don't know what it is, but we had like five wasps nests just on my property. They even built a wasp nest in the back door of my van. There was like a little place where the back windshield wiper used to go. I think it was gone before we ever even bought the car back in the day. But the wasps went inside this little hole and built a freaking wasp nest inside the back door of my van. And I had to stand out there with a hose and like spray it into the hole and wait for the wasps to stumble out of it. And then I'd stomp on them really fast before they got pissed off and stung me. <sighs> yeah, I'm kind of scared of wasps, but not the rest of them. I don't know. I don't know. What other stinging insects are there? Are there any? Okay, well, how about like flying ants, hornets, bumblebees, bees, wasps, yellow jackets? Are they all, are they actually different? I mean, I know that bees and wasps are different. And I think hornets are actually something different, but isn't like a yellow jacket another name for a wasp? And a bumblebee and a bee are the same too, right? Are are there hornets out in this neck of the woods? Sure, the, the hornets are the black ones. Hmm. Or purple. Or I don't know if I've ever really seen a hornet, to tell you the truth. Maybe I have, but I don't know. I'm terrified of wasps. I don't know what it is. I just thought. <laughs> well, I, I was stung yeah. by wasps when I was a little kid. Yeah. And it's just, and that's all it takes, really. One time I, I, I saw this great comedian where he's talking about wasps. And he's like, wasps are the skinheads of the insect world. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in the wood pile behind the house, these wasps had built this big nest. And one day I thought, I'm going to kill them all. And so I got like an aerosol can of spray and I just sprayed and sprayed and sprayed. And then I put a <laughs> match it. to it and spray it. And the entire wood pile just... And, and you burned your house down? I burned the house. I burned half the town down. I burned down Chicago. Oh. They blamed it on the cow. It was just... Oh, good. At least they didn't catch you. I. It was the burning of Atlanta. You know, I just... <laughs> I blamed it on Ulysses S. Grant. Well, that didn't come out well. You burned all of Washington, D.C. and just blamed it on the English. Canadians at time, actually. That's why the White House is white. <sighs> Number 28. Fuzzy caterpillars. <laughs> Man, I'm not really scared of... It's like tomato worms. They're cute. Okay. I never got quarters for finding caterpillars and ridding us of them, but... but what would you do with the tomato worms? Tell the truth, I don't remember. Garbage disposal? Probably oh, probably garbage can. Number 29. And this one's an odd one. When all the dinner stuff is close to you. <laughs> Condiments and bowls and gravy boats. And you know, I actually remember this comment. And I thought it was hilarious fun where she said that she was claustrophobic. And so her kids would, like, purposely freak her out by pushing all the stuff on the dinner table closer to her so she'd feel closed in. But I thought that was hilarious. I think so, too. But do you <laughs> share that fear in any You know, I'm not that afraid of being claustrophobic. But the other day I was at this place where it was just really busy. There was all sorts of people. And all of a sudden, seriously, I started to freak out because I was basically trapped. And I was like, whoa, hold Holy crap, I gotta get out of this because I'm starting to freak out. That usually doesn't happen to me. But I think I might get scared of really small places, like if I was stuck under a bed or in a box or I don't know what claustrophobic people are really afraid of. Being pinned in. My wife is, I, I guess you could say it's claustrophobic. Basically, like sometimes if you have her arms pinned down or something like that to the point where she feels like she can't move, she'll freak out. She's like, I can't move. Get, let me go. I can't move. I can't. Stop it. 
And so sometimes I'll just do that just for fun. Like Liz's kids who would push the ketchup and everything towards her. Was it Liz? To, yeah. Just to see her freak out. <laughs> that <laughs> cracks me up. Here, you know, uh, another funny quick story to go along with that. My wife is also, I don't know if it's a fear or not, but she just really, really dislikes breathing in somebody else's exhalation. I don't know why it is, but sometimes I'll mess with her in that in that same way where I'll purposely get to the spot where when I breathe, it's going to go into her face. I'll just breathe on her and she gets all freaked out about it. Correct yes, but up. you just eat onions raw, right? That, like might, that might be part of it. To tell you the truth, I don't really like that either. Somebody's just like right in your face and you're breathing out and that's like all you're getting in. That can be a little freaky. Okay, so that's what, the first half of our list? You actually have more, don't you? I, I had no idea it would go out of control like this. All right, so we're just going to cut this off here. We've had a good amount of fun, but there is twice as much fun to still be had because we've got another whole bunch of irrational fears to speak about. So we'll talk some more about that. And we'll probably try and make people sick with the next half. <laughs> Hopefully next week we'll be able to add it into next week's show. If not, soon. We'll, t we'll do the rest of our list. So stay subscribed. I was going to say stay tuned, but the show's over so don't stay tuned stay subscribed to this for the next episode the next thrilling chapter of irrational, irrational fear, fear. Irrational, you know what? irrational fear wouldn't be a bad name for a podcast yeah better than the doonstein we change our name you know speaking of the doonstein rish i've always wondered what does that mean well i thought we were out of time but no i'll, I'll say i'll, I'll explain <laughs> Nah, we're out of time. Nice one. All right. Thank you for listening all the way yeah. through the end. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was uh, We had a good time anyways. Uh, yeah, I had a blast doing it. So much so that if you come back next week, you get more of the same. <laughs> That's right. And as we always say, if you enjoyed this show half as much as we enjoyed doing it, then we enjoyed it twice as much as you. <laughs> Okay. See, math was never my strong suit, but I'll yeah. just take your word for it. I'm... Monty Python taught me that, so... Oh! There you go. Well, they would know. Yeah, they're smart. Say no more! <laughs> Until that day, I remain Rish Outfield. And uh, I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm packing my bags for the Misty Mountains. Where the spirits go. At the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Doonstief is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. The knight huffed and walked back into the crowd. Oh, didn't you? <laughs> that huff was so awesome. <laughs> really? Well, I did him as a bit of a surfer. I hope you like that. And Harbinger, take two. Or eight, in this case. Burdoko license? We could train a Burdoko. The frick is a Burdoko, anyway? Your mother-in-law. Oh. I, you have. Judgment is rendered fair to you. That is god-awful. And uh, so all I gotta do is sound like I'm dying in Chinese? Great. <laughs> Should get one of the Chinese kids I threw in jail. Your reaction? My player is a 12-year-old blonde girl from upstate New York. She named me Peach Butt. <laughs> that was someone uh, putting some whipped cream on something in the background? <laughs> no, it was some stupid thing turned on down here. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> he waved at the oncomer. Never seen that word in my whole life. Have you? <laughs> Don't know. Huh. Probably not. Newcomer. Beachcomer. Not. You eat the whole buffet. What Chinese food gone? American. I hate that that is pronounced chitin. I hate that. Because chitin is such a cool word. Oh, Shitness is yeah, my favorite. You were just in the other room. Chitin. <laughs> you can't make noise.
I know. I'm sorry. Jeez. Well, you always hit me in the face, John. Well, defend yourself. All right. <laughs> All right. Peach Butt said. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you were going oh, wait, to Wait, wait, let me say it. I mean, in case I laughed when I said it first. Peach Butt said. <laughs> you still laughed. You can it's hear hard the not big to. smile on your face and your words. Starving children. Naked starving children. Being molested. Peach Butt said. Damn it. Do you know how many bunyips? What the F? Is it bunyip? Yeah, that sounds okay. right to me. Cyril didn't know which response would keep his neck in it. <clears throat> Cyril didn't know which were. Cyril didn't know which were. <laughs> Are you all right over there? Cyril didn't know which response would keep his heck and Ned. <laughs> Start from there again. Is it tiny? A little funky. Funk you. Logged out. And. Beep beep beep. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. It's the beep of the logging out, of course. <laughs>